be recording. Can I say something about that? No, I don't know. This is on YouTube. My thesis uh, today is um, that there are specific elements, there are specific social mechanisms that mediate between ecosystem services and well-being. Um, and that understanding these specific mechanisms is absolutely central to understanding some of the paradoxes, some of the apparent paradoxes about how and why uh, ecosystem services um, are in decline, uh, why they are uh, not necessarily the answer, the solution to all our problems, how poverty persists, uh, and the rest of it. The specific mechanisms I'm going to talk about are um, around mobility, human mobility, around social relations and the so-called moral economy, of how people interact, contract with each other, uh, have um, uh, uh, debt um, uh, systems, uh, reciprocity, and the like. Uh, and uh, and I'm going. To, and uh, but there are other elements, I think, to the way that we've conceptualised ecosystem services, uh, which are, I think, un which um, uh, in both ecology and in social science. Uh, which I think have underplayed, uh, which have been underplayed by the methods that we've actually used to, to look at ecosystem services. Specifically, their variability, their variability in time, because many ecosystem services or the benefits that flow from many ecosystem services are uh, highly variable in time, are only available for short periods, um, and uh, therefore uh, many of the benefits that would flow from those are periodic uh, within a annual cycle or within a, a longer uh, time period. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about those uh, issues uh, and a number of paradoxes, uh, apparent paradoxes around uh, ecosystem services in the context of Delta, Delta environments, uh, and uh, as part of a large collaboration uh, between scientists in Bangladesh and scientists uh, in the UK uh, in a project that looks at multiple dimensions of well-being, including health outcomes. So the overall project is called Assessing Health Livelihoods, Ecosystem Services, and Poverty Alleviation in Populist Deltas. And uh, this very large multidisciplinary um, crowd, let's say, we refer to ourselves as the crowd, um, uh, do so um, uh, looking at in the past, in the present, and the future, but the social science involved, and uh, this is just listing most of the social scientists that are involved in this, uh, led by, uh, in Bangladesh, by the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, and by a public health laboratory, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, um, and a number of social scientists in the UK. And um, we have, um, we realized that, that to come to a understanding of the role of ecosystem services in providing well-being, uh, we need it to go back to basics. Now, virtually everyone in the room, I suspect, knows something about ecosystem services, um, but I can uh, uh, assure you, or I can reassure you, that one of the great things to do, uh, and don't be scared to do it within a big multidisciplinary project, is to, in effect, start up a reading group and what we did, this large multidisciplinary group, was we picked 12 seminal papers that have been published in the last 10 years on ecosystem services to try and discern what's new. Uh, because we're all working on little bits of it, but actually this collective exercise of trying to discern what it is that's at the frontier, what do we actually know about ecosystem services, to, um, to also to get to a common language was uh, exceedingly uh, helpful and important. Some of these are findings from this, this is just my summary of it, some of these are findings of what we know in, about ecosystem services. And some of them I think are fairly untested. Um, but anyway, these are my uh, reflections. It's 10 years since the publication of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment said that ecosystem services are the benefits that humans get from the environment. Uh, things have moved on in the last 10 years, uh, but nevertheless there are a number of uh, findings, I think, that are held to be universally true. Data system services globally uh, and locally are in decline and threatened. That was a major finding of the Trends Working Group of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. 
And that hasn't really been questioned in the 10 years since. There's been a lot of work on trade-offs um, and an assumption that you can't have the best of all worlds, that there are trade-offs between elements of ecosystem services and their social dynamics, that there is no easy optimization between well-being and ecosystem services, and that these two are in trade-off with each other, um, that there is no e uh, easy uh, optimization between conservation of services and well-being, or sort of conservation of services and development uh, of those, assuming that all development processes involve, involve the consumptive use of ecosystem services. Um, that, I think, um, has, uh, has some merit, and at one level is you know, uh, very obviously true. Then there's been a huge amount of effort in the past uh, decade to map and measure ecosystem services. With the conclusion in virtually every paper that does this that says we've got a new method for mapping, we've mapped these more accurately, that the mapping and measuring of ecosystem services leads to their greater recognition, and that this information is useful for decision makers and will help in this optimization process. So if you don't know what you've got, what those uh, processes are, that more information, more scientific information, particularly mapping information, is going to assist in that. And equally, that the creation of economic incentives or the creation of markets even for some of these ecosystem services will also lead uh, to their conservation. But I think one of the more interesting parts, whenever you read this, and again, there's a sort of cacophony of information about ecosystem services, and um, so people are referring to, to different things. As I said, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment said that ecosystem services are just all the benefits that we get from nature. But there are dozens of classification systems that make very subtle distinctions between this and say that everyone else is wrong, and adopt, adopt my classification system, uh, and the rest of it. So there isn't yet a fixed or a universal classification system for ecosystem services in the terms that we use. Um, but to me, that it doesn't seem to be so much of a problem. It is if you want to do specific comparable uh, work, but there is an acceptable plurality, uh, I think, in the way that we use these terms, um, and therefore, um, uh, we don't all have to buy into the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment um, terminology and classification, uh, particularly because of issues that have already been pointed out by Brendan Fisher and others of double counting uh, and the rest of it. Um, there are issues at the margins of ecosystem service process and function which are actually difficult to classify. Uh, issues around abiotic services, particularly around water, or for example, naturally occurring, uh, what some people would call ecological disservices, like um, natural arsenic in groundwater uh, and that sort of thing. And so uh, within, that, uh, within that arena, there seems to be a, uh, a growing sort of consensus uh, that in fact, uh, ecosystem services as we talk about them, should be the biophysical processes by which uh, are the, this is, the ecosystem services are still the ecology bit, if you like, um, and that what these ecosystem services are, um, they are underpinned obviously by ecosystem processes and functions, um, but that they produce then goods and benefits, and goods and benefits provide uh, us human beings uh, with uh, you know, an increase in our welfare, an increase in our longevity, an increase in our well-being uh, in some sense, or quality of life, uh, enhance our preferences, and the rest of it. Um, but as I said, there are a number of uh, apparent paradoxes here. And one that's been pointed out by uh, Piara Roundsup, Gary Peterson, and others, as they have um, elaborated it, is what they call the environmentalist's paradox, uh, which is, why is human well-being increasing as decreasing as ecosystem services degraded at the global scale? So that, that well-being continues to increase. The world is getting a better place. People are, however you measure well-being, people are living longer on average. Uh, there are significant 
uh, proportions of the world, that, uh, of populations in the world that have been lifted out of poverty, or at least um, have an increase in um, their direct material well-being, um, including health, education, and other indicators over time, um, uh, despite ecosystem services going down. So if the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is right, that we're all ultimately dependent on it, that seems to be a paradox. Now this paradox can be explained in a number of ways, and uh, the authors of this paper are ready for forward and saying, you know, uh, what's this about? Now, paradoxes are useful in scientific terms because they hurt your um, scientific antennae and say, well, actually, there must be an explanation to that. And, I'm going to, you know, and they allow you to develop um, hypotheses and ways to, to look at these things. So a lot of the um, obvious answers to this paradox are we haven't hit the brick wall yet. There are tipping points in, uh, in ecological systems at global and other scales. And we're heading for a crash in well-being whenever those, uh, uh, whenever we reach those uh, thresholds, or that actually technology uh, has allowed us to substitute uh, natural capital um, by uh, for physical, for physical human and other capital, and it means that, that we are ultimately going to, to some extent, actually divorce ourselves from the our dependence on ecosystem services or other sorts of explanations. One of the other explanations is we're not measuring well-being well enough and we're focusing only on the material aspects of it. So that got us thinking. Uh, and in the context of working in South Asia in uh, the Ganges brown Putra Della, there are a number of other paradoxes uh, that arise that are uh, related, I guess, <coughs> to, this, to this relationship between well-being <coughs> between well-being and other uh, elements and one of them is this, it's actually known as the Bangladesh Surprise, or in fact, Bangladesh Conundrum, as it's sometimes known. And this is from uh, Azadullah and colleagues, who basically point out that despite Bangladesh being a country, this is the country that we're going to focus on, um, being a country that has low income levels, low income per capita, even despite high economic growth in the last 15 years or so, um, uh, that, and also this, uh, that basically, that, what, that despite that, despite low income levels, it's well ahead of most other countries at safe levels of income in terms of social indicators, in terms of social outcomes, in terms of uh, gender equality, in terms of health, in terms of literacy, in terms of well-being. So is there something that despite Bangladesh apparently having a uh, being susceptible to significant economic shocks associated with, for example, natural hazards, and despite actually being pretty low on the corruption and transparency indices, i.e. not having good government, it has all these very positive outcomes. Explained in large part in this analysis to do with the role of civil society and the role of non-government organizations in delivering many of these, uh, in delivering many of these benefits. And similarly, or part of the same story, really, the Bangladesh paradox, which is exceptional health achievement, uh, but in, in, the, uh, in the delivery of health services and in outcomes for people who live there, uh, despite economic poverty, as measured in this case by malnutrition. So we have these uh, different signals going on, countries that um, are uh, regions um, that, uh, thank you. Uh, Just Jim. <laughs> um, uh, we have these different signals going on and these you know, different paradoxes about how well-being is evolving uh, in a place where uh, populous deltas uh, where that have fantastic natural resources that are highly productive um, and have easy access to services, to markets and the rest of it, but yet lack of well-being and poverty still persists within them. So how does, um, how does the Delta area of Bangladesh look in terms of these ecosystem services? So this is Sabar Hussain, just published um, his PhD at uh, Saipathan, which is part of this uh, project with John Deering and colleagues, who, uh, and John uh, and his colleagues do like these time series of uh, ecosystem services. They've published them for uh, Eastern China, uh, globally, all sorts of things. But basically what this shows is that in this line, 
um, that uh, provisioning ecosystem services, have, as they've termed it, food production, has risen steadily over the last um, uh, five decades or so, and this is in the Delta uh, part of, um, uh, of Bangladesh, uh, that GDP has also risen, um, but actually, it's slightly difficult to see uh, the colours, but basically all the water indices, water quality, uh, availability of water has declined, so many of the regulated services, or the, most of the food production, has been at an expense, you could say, of many of the um, uh, regulating services uh, actually in decline. So, based on that information, what does the social science do to try and sort of uh, resolve these conundrums, surprises, and paradoxes? Um, well, what we uh, have done, so I'll point out this uh, study area, is um, uh, that we're focusing on, it, the delta as we de defined it in uh, physical terms, basically represents uh, the two divisions of Barashal and Kulna in southern Bangladesh, uh, which takes up nine divisions. It also includes the Chandrabhan <coughs> National Park and the 10,000 square kilometers of mangroves. Um, I should also say that those social uh, parameters that, that, we've, uh, that I mentioned are also common in this place. This is a place with total fertility rates. Sorry, Bangladesh is the eighth most populous country in the world, it's about 145 million people in the last census. 10% of them live in this area. Uh, so this is around about, 14, uh, around about 14 million people. And that's about the same number of people uh, in the 2001 census as in the 2011 census. So the population is stable, aging, and emigrating, in effect, uh, in this area. Uh, so we've had, uh, and there are at least, uh, so half the uh, districts of the nine districts that we're looking at, actually have population declines in the last, uh, between the last two censuses. So what this shows is that actually one of the key parameters, one of the key demographic and social parameters uh, in the future in this area of Bangladesh is actually the rate of migration. Uh, although there will be a continued increase in the aggregate population of Bangladesh because of uh, the inertia within all you know, populations, uh, that in fact, uh, this area has a stable population and an aging population uh, and probably a higher dependency ratio going forward. So migration becomes the single most dominant demographic issue uh, uh, in this particular area. Um, so social scientists, our strategy then was to actually go out and uh, uh, it has a title, it's called Grounded Theory, something that's rather, sounds rather grand, to actually collect some primary data um, without reference to too many high, uh, specific hypotheses, without specific uh, hypothesis testing, using open-ended qualitative uh, data analysis. Uh, interviewed 75 uh, picked, tried to think of how this actually fits within social ecological systems, went right across what these are the location of the um, households that we interviewed um, over the period of six to, six to nine months um, to try to, uh, to have a, an empirical feel as well as a theoretical feel to these mechanisms that I've, uh, that I've already mentioned. And what we derived, in effect, was this. The ecosystem services um, partially do, but actually what we need to do is to ensure that we relate them to social ecological systems, not necessarily to places or to administrative units on the ground, which is how a lot of ecosystem services mapping is actually done. So there are three elements here. First of all, we want to look at social ecological systems, and we want to look at the elements of those ecosystems ecological systems, which are made up, of course, of individual strategies and decisions by individuals um, and uh, their management of resources within that system. And of course, all these systems have external drivers, including environmental change and shocks, uh, but also these other things that are going on, these interventions that are enhancing well-being, including um, all those uh, education, health, and all the other investments that we know are going on uh, in, in the area. So that we're saying, and this is the thesis, the hypotheses that we started with, that aggregate well-being, 
that how um, uh, within these is multidimensional. It is material, but it's also, um, as we put it, to do with health outcomes, but also it's relational and subjective. So there are these different elements of well-being. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, um, but I will raise that uh, in discussion. The way that the, in this pentagon, uh, the environment, you know, the, the way that, that uh, ecosystem processes and functions lead to final ecosystem services is through the productivity of the systems, but also that is uh, limited then or, or ameliorated by the high seasonality of many of the ecosystem services within the system. And that's a real limit on people's ability to access them and to um, gain uh, either direct livelihood uh, from these. And then there are three other elements here. The first one is uh, the issue of access. So it's all about property rights. Ecosystem services may be there in theory in relating to be, uh, uh, those benefits to be actually reaped by those who can access them. Um, but who is able to access them? And the distribution of that access is uh, absolutely uh, critical to uh, whether or not that the benefits of those ecosystem services are widely distributed or even realized at all. The second area is uh, what we call uh, social relations, and um, what's been described by James Scott and others as the moral economy, which is a set of interactions between people in, particularly in resource-based fisheries and agriculture-based systems, um, which is a set of relationships between people in terms of reciprocity, debt, um, and other of those types of social function. It explains, it's an attempt to explain why people act in potentially risk averse ways and don't maximize things. They are prepared to take on, in this case, uh, contracts such as sharecropping, where you divide the outcomes of your neighbor 50 50 with the owner of the land. It sounds an absolutely terrible deal. Um, but sharecropping persists um, as a social, uh, because it, uh, it um, fulfills a social function in that the landowners have a responsibility um, to their sharecroppers, uh, particularly in times of uh, crisis and the rest of it. And finally, mobility. The recognition that people move and that ecosystem services move and are fluctuating uh, as well. Now, you need, uh, what demographic theory tells us is uh, that uh, you need quite a lot of capital to be able to move to become a migrant. And so this is something that is um, uh, an important uh, 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 step uh, and potential stepping stone towards capital accumulation and that allows people to uh, access ecosystem services. So let me uh, try and illustrate that, uh, give you an example uh, of this. Do people actually manage to get the money to uh, move, to go and move from a rural area where they're living into a big city by over exploiting ecosystem services. So you, you turn your ecosystem, you know, your natural resources and ecosystems into money, which allows you to increase your mobility, which actually then allows you to uh, get on a path to um, a pathway out of poverty. That's one possibility. A second uh, possibility, uh, of course, is that those households involved uh, in migration in agriculture resource-based economies receive, uh, sorry, involved in migration receive remittances. What do you do with remittances? Very good evidence that people don't consume what they get for and uh, don't have immediate consumption needs with, what, with remittances. What they do is they invest them. And they invest in them in human capital and education and other things, but also in physical capital. So uh, is uh, is the flow of remittances a means by which uh, which results in the over-exploitation of uh, natural resources, particularly, for example, the use of remittances uh, to buy into shrimp sure, aquaculture? It's been shown in the past. So there's this complex relationship between uh, mobility and the use of ecosystem services uh, and as a, uh, a means to uh, increase well-being. So that is how we're trying to resolve these conundrums by saying, well, actually, it's these things. These are intervening mechanisms that, that, uh, uh, 
that mediate the relationship between ecosystem services and well-being. Uh, and we realized that, of course, whenever you try to look at uh, these, uh, these uh, ecosystem services, that in fact, some of them are, you know, you could have mapped them on the ground, and some of them are actually much more associated with fluctuating resources and other sorts of resources. So in the end, what we're doing, we have seven social ecological systems in, del in the delta that we are happy to look at. We think this is a fairly uh, robust you know, classification system. It certainly applies to other deltas that we're um, uh, planning uh, to look at. So some of them are associated with a land use category, and some of them are, uh, are uh, associated with uh, other things. So we have seven, which are uh, the riverine zones, uh, which are characterized by um, uh, char islands and uh, high rates of erosion and, and low rates of uh, security of tenure and that sort of thing. We have coastal marine uh, zones. We have this, uh, these um, uh, areas around here which are dependent on the Sundarban uh, 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 mangrove system. And then we have others which are basically uh, wet season versus irrigated rice and freshwater uh, shrimp versus saltwater shrimp, with the freshwater shrimp being uh, up in this area near the uh, city of um, Kovna. So um, I, I won't go into the mechanism by how, how we then turn those social ecological systems into a union and that at the union level, um, but it's uh, basically by the dominant uh, 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 resource use within those to then uh, make this sort of spatially relevant. Uh, and we worked in 63, have been working in 63 uh, villages within those tech segments of each village. It's about 150 households and um, undertake the household roster and find out everything we need to know about those households and then sample from that, which is 10,000, down to 1,500 households and, and uh, try to collect <coughs> data that will allow us to test these intervening mechanisms. And I will uh, just talk through uh, these just to point out a couple of the issues that we've talked about. Uh, income and livelihood diversification, ecosystem service use, labor migration, loans, uh, assets, uh, so not confusing income with wealth, uh, shocks, place attachment, how uh, people feel about the place uh, that they live in to do with uh, which relates to migration decision making, length of residence, and various other things. Uh, environmental, perceived environmental quality uh, changing over time. Household food uh, consumption, so a lot of uh, consumption based um, measures. Uh, and finally, um, uh, salinity, 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 sorry, uh, measured not at the household level, but at, uh, in the, at the village level. Uh, but also a number of health outcomes, including. Uh, blood pressure to measure uh, the relationship between hypertension and uh, salinity. Uh, and also, global satisfaction with life, uh, which is a, a term for an off-the-shelf um, or well-established uh, set of uh, social well-being uh, measurements. Um, uh, and so we have lots of different ways to measure well-being, which is health outcomes, income and material uh, outcomes, but also some perception stuff to do with uh, uh, satisfaction with life. The anthropometry uh, is basically, now you can't quite see that, is uh, measuring children, their uh, body mass index, uh, and this is uh, just uh, measuring the um, uh, solidity in the wells and the rest of it. Um, so, oh, and I should say that we're repeating this survey because one of the key things that we think is important here is that most of these, most of the ecosystem services, both regulating and provisioning, are not around most of the time. And so we're repeating this um, to get a monthly record of this. We're actually only repeating it three times over the course of the year. And uh, the survey, the third round of the survey, is going out on Sunday. I hope is uh, uh, finished uh, at the minute. So, uh, uh, so these are, in the spirit of this uh, seminar series, this is work in progress. I've only got some uh, preliminary uh, uh, results on this, um, but I think nevertheless they're worth looking at and um, 
uh, and worth uh, reflecting on. Um, so first of all, just there are diverse incomes and high levels of both farm and off-farm income uh, in these places, uh, which are you know, sampled representatively um, for all the social ecological systems. So they're even within, so, so most social ecological systems are complex, even if they are, even if we're talking about fishing villages or if we're talking about systems that where, as far as I can see, is um, as uh, saltwater shrimp aquaculture. Um, there's a high variance of, uh, across social ecological systems in terms of poverty. Interestingly, the highest levels of poverty so this is the proportion of the population who is uh, in poverty and uh, who are not in poverty. Uh, the highest uh, is actually in the system, which is freshwater shrimp aquaculture, which is actually the most diverse system. It's relatively, in our study area, it's relatively close to markets, it's relatively close to Kona, and it has all sorts of integrated systems, but actually has um, a high, higher incidence of poverty as we're measured, sorry, I should, say I'm just measuring poverty in income terms uh, in these slides. I haven't got into many of the other measures in terms of uh, health outcomes and the like. And actually the shrimp aquaculture, the you know, commercial um, uh, saltwater shrimp aquaculture, which actually has displaced lots of people and there's much less, um, you would imagine to be uh, uh, you know, much more exclusionary, much less property rights, much, many more landless laborers involved Actually, in this case, is a lower incidence of poverty, um, at least from the uh, first, two, first round. This is only from the first round of the survey. In terms of um, dependence on ecosystem services, it's common to all, um, but actually, in these mixed systems of freshwater, you know, uh, aquaculture systems, is the dominant use in this uh, system. It's the highest number of people gaining income from ecosystem services, but also happens to have the highest poverty incidence. Poverty is associated both with high dependence and with no dependence. So if you just, if we, you know, just look at uh, populations from each of our seven, in each of our seven, and say, well, what, um, and try to classify them as not being dependent on ecosystem services, so having a non-agriculture or non, directly non, um, uh, a, a job that's directly not uh, associated with um, uh, with agriculture, fishery, forestry, um, or their household that doesn't access open access resources, and um, up to uh, at the top end, 100% uh, uh, dependence, uh, then you can see uh, that actually you seem to have a higher percentage for for all of the systems. You have this sort of U-shaped um, uh, relationship here, where actually it's people who aren't who aren't dependent on ecosystem services at all. And people who are 100% dependent on ecosystem services tend to have a higher incidence of poverty in those types of households. And temporary migration uh, and remittances are also associated with less poverty, which shows that actually migration is one of the ways of moving away um, uh, from these, uh, out of these social ecological systems and providing remittance incomes is in some senses, you know, some of the ways uh, out of this. Clearly there's highest temporary migration when resources fluctuate, as in the Sunderband, where you get people going out collecting honey for two, three months of the year, but only at one particular season that we must have managed to capture in this particular one. So that's just to give you a flavour. We haven't actually managed to, I don't have an answer to it. I've got my theses. I've got a lot of descriptive statistics at the minute. We're building the models and they're not quite there yet. Um, but. Um, I think this is, uh, raises a number of uh, questions. To summarize our results, dependence on ecosystem services is, a, is high in all social ecological systems in the deltas that we're looking at, but it varies. Poverty also is very unevenly spread, has high variance within the social, eco social ecological systems, um, and there is this conundrum about uh, both um, people who are completely outside of the agricultural economy or the fisheries economy uh, being, uh, having, uh, not being able to access these high levels of uh, poverty, but also those who have a high dependence, which points to uh, the role of ecosystem services as insurance 
uh, for those people at the bottom of the uh, income pile, as it were. And migration is a positive mechanism, tends to be used by better off households to increase their well-being, but how this now relates to what they do with it, uh, with remittance income, and how this relates to, to uh, the sustainability of ecosystem services, something that we want to uh, investigate. The implications of this, of course, is that, that strategies to conserve uh, and to make sustainable ecosystem service use are necessary, but there's in no way are they sufficient uh, in terms of a role of promoting well-being. And that most of the increases in well-being that we've seen, the Bangladesh conundrum and the rest of it, have actually been through social, uh, social interventions to do with gender equality, family planning, education, the access to education and various other uh, issues. And so we need to understand these mechanisms. And if we do this, what this, if these mechanisms turn out to be important in terms of how ecosystem services work, uh, then where, where you will want to sort of design your interventions or think about that sort of resource management and the preservation of ecosystem services are actually to do with people's mobility, uh, about their security of tenure, and various other uh, areas, uh, not necessarily directly on natural resource management. So, how would I uh, uh, sum this up or think of wider lessons uh, for the centre or um, uh, for other areas? Uh, these paradoxes, I think, need resolution. Um, but, as I said, I think par paradoxes work very well to stimulate thought. Um, if you can resolve the paradox, then, uh, then that's uh, the road to uh, actually gaining some scientific uh, uh, knowledge. And what we have said in this is that trying to resolve this or looking at these particular conundrums or these sort of surprising outcomes in the case of this uh, Delta area, it's actually through theories of how societies, economies, and how preferences actually work, including those social processes like mobility, like social relations and the moral economy. <coughs> in terms of uh, ecosystem services, one thing, and I'm sure this resonates with people at the centre, one thing that really strikes me and has always struck me uh, is that most ecosystem service science is a very geographically and place-based science that is amenable to GIS mapping and the rest of it. But actually, um, we, it's been a bit of a compromise between making this analysis spatial, as we've had to do using union-level data, but actually focusing on social ecological systems, which I think is a more fruitful way to look at the, these particular interactions. Because most resources fluctuate in space and time, not least, of course, everything that's in the marine environment. But the mobility of people, I think, is increasingly uh, important. Uh, and that the interaction between fluctuating resources and fluctuating people, I think, is a really fruitful area for uh, for uh, dialogue uh, and uh, for research. And finally, I'll say, of course, that, that well-being, and I haven't really talked about <coughs> this today, we haven't explored this in the data that much, but well-being has multiple dimensions. As we've said, material, which is what we get from the environment that we can turn into uh, food, fibre, and income. Uh, but it's also to do with health. In this particular delta, a lot of the issues are to do with salinity, arsenic, uh, and the rest of it. So the ecosystems provide the services as well as services uh, in some senses. Uh, but it's also to do, it's also relational and subjective. And by relational and subjective well-being, I mean uh, uh, how you perceive your uh, well-being relative to others around you. And in a relational sense, uh, which is how, how well-being is actually experienced, not least on how that's um, how that's experienced in terms of communities and how people feel about the places that they live. So we can't divorce, of course, most ecosystem services uh, from, uh, from place. Um, papers will be forthcoming. This is work in progress.